the relationship between these kind of uh, practices, concentration, because we cannot stay 24 hours with Baba, very easily we get distracted, so, so we use different uh, kind of uh, tools to, to have, to have the, the mind focus. The distraction is of two types. The distraction on the surface level, for instance, you are interested to do something, but you are distracted. You want to do computer, or you want to watch TV, or you want to sit here in Sansa. You are very much interested to do it. But what happens is, when you sit here and when you are trying to listen to it, suddenly the thoughts will go, or you may be thinking of something else. What will happen there in the room, and what happens here, and what happens there what is happening there in my at home or you may be distracted by sleep there are so many distractions to the activity even though our interest is there our natural focus is there on particular uh, object particular work because of our past habits this habitual distractions distractions will become even though if you sit in dwarka mai and you enjoy it so much Still, at one point, that the thoughts go. If you watch, in fact, you are not interested in the content of the thoughts. Because of the habit, it goes. And by practicing something, like a concentration or a meditation or whatever it may be, a mantra, these can only solve, this can only remove that habitual distraction on the surface level. But at the bottom of it, there is the essential focus which depends upon our main interest and our goal. And whenever that I talk in the substance, I talk about that only. Because the other things that are rampant in the market, these practices, how to do, how to control the mind, how to control this and how to control that. But they only work on the surface level. And if this, this deeper into the this focus is intensified, the interest is in intensified and the emotion becomes stronger, then even without any practice, even the surface distraction will also be removed. What I try to do is, I try to the basic level, what are the emotions that are, that are conflicting, which gives you a clarity of what actually you need. And actually what, even though your lack of focus to the object of your love, so at the emotional level, if the, if the work is done, then it becomes easy. Even without any practice of all this concentration and anything, it naturally stays. If you are really interested in something, you don't get even sleep, you will not be distracted. Only after when it comes to monotonous, when it becomes a routine and when it becomes a habit, then other habitual things come and distract you. So let us work at the deeper level. That is why I always say that don't beat about the bush. The real snake will not be killed. Guruji, when, I, when sitting in Dwarkamaya and I'm looking at Baba's picture, the feeling of love is there and the thought comes up, will come, I love you, Baba. And then I was thinking about it and it was just coming, thinking, well, what is it I love? about Baba, I don't know the man, you know, and what I, what I was loving, it seemed, was the love. And I asked myself, well, what is it you love? You lo I love the love. But it I, is but what I have, I have always uh, tell you in all the satsangs that always I stress you. You have given a very concrete example for that. I always say that you only surrender to your own sense of fulfillment and not to Sai Baba at all. It seems as if that you are loving Sai Baba and you are surrendering to Sai Baba and you are following him and all this stuff. But what you are doing is your own sense of fulfillment. Yeah. Why you love Sai Baba is in the Sai Baba's presence in the Dwaraka Mai that you get the sense of uh, uh, peace or fulfillment and whatever yeah. you call it. You are happy. Because if he, he causes it, you think that you love him. Right. If it doesn't give you that happiness, you know more love him. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. right.
Because what is there? Why you have to love Sai Baba? As you told, you do not know the man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you haven't met him and you have any personal connections with him. So it, it seems too unreasonable and irrational simply to say that I love Sai Baba. Nobody can love. We only love what he triggers in you. Right. Because you already love this, because he triggers it, when it expresses outwardly, you say that Sai, you love Sai Baba. Because you do not, if you say that I love my own love, I love my own peace means it is too abstract. If at all you love it, even though that you love it, it won't come. It comes only by, tri- by that trigger mm-hmm. and, it, and you give it to him. And the expressions take different forms. And actually when you are experiencing that, you need not say I love Sai Baba and I love Sai Baba. You simply love it. You love, you, you love him, that's all. And how it expresses the intensity, it depends upon the need also. You will love coffee. In fact, you don't love exactly that coffee, that stuff. That stuff which the, the, the stimulation and the taste which it produces in you. What you love, in fact, is that stimulation which comes through coffee. Even though that you look, love coffee and you may take it twice or thrice or t- uh, ten times a day, now it is very cold. Now you need some warmth. The need for stimulation and warmth is more now. Now you always love to have a cup of coffee. And when a cup of coffee is offered to you, how you hug it and how you show it? You just touch the cup. Why you are touching the cup? Not because you love the, you, you love the cup, the warmth that you take into the body like this, and then, and then put it like this, <laughs> the coffee, and then, <laughs> and then slowly, <sighs> like that, as if the, you take the whole warmth of it. <laughs> the, <laughs> the colder it is, the better the expression. <laughs> what exactly you are loving, is that the coffee or the cup? Hmm? So these are the expressions that we use. Sometimes when you go, at one time that you may not feel so much love in Dwarka at one time, you do not feel so much here when sitting in satsang. Right. And another day, you may feel the intensity. Yeah. The next day, you may not feel it. It all depends what you have done in the day and what emotions have come up and with which that you are trying to fight out. And in the cold or heat of it, when you come and then when because of the need is there, that you take it and you experience it. Avidly. Mm-hmm. Could you talk about initiation and do you initiate people? In the normal sense of the word initiate, yes I do. And in the, the aesthetic sense of the word I don't. I initiate you. For instance, I want you to go to Dhamanagar tomorrow. I am initiating you to go to Initiate means to trigger, to push, to give a direction. Hmm? to introduce <laughs> and with regard of initiation like uh, blowing a mantra into your ears <laughs> that I won't do <laughs> our initiation by the, through the seven rays these things I, I don't know Fear comes because it, with the, with the sense of loss of something which you love most. It springs from love. Because you love something and if you are insecure, if you are afraid that you may lose it, then fear comes. The basic fear what we call is fear of death. Even that fear comes because you love your life so much, you don't want to part with it. And because that there is a possibility that you may lose it, that gives you the fear of death. Fear of death is the result of your love of life. In all the fears at various levels, in our, even in our daily life, that fear is the outcome of 
the thought that you may lose something which you love very much. In the personal development, usually everybody has this fear in different aspects and for different reasons and different causes. But when the fear comes, what the, the, the fear, the personal development level, it acts like a, an impediment because it doesn't, the personality doesn't unfold, grow easily. When it tries to grow is when you have an anchor, a sense of security. A child grows fast. But child is very timid. Usually she is afraid even to go out of this, to go alone, to stay alone, to eat alone, to go to bathroom alone. See how many fears a child has. But she has the anchor, the mother, the, the father. The security is there, the sense of security. And that sense of security coupled with these fears, so these fears are expressed or they are worked out in such a way that it, it, it is able to work out, able to connect with different people, connect, able to adapt itself to the environment freely because of the security which it subconsciously experiences. The fear doesn't become an impediment. The fear becomes a push, an initiation to achieve something, to, go, to get something. And when that sense of security is not there, that anchor is not there, then it suppresses, it, may, it becomes a detrimental, a harmful influence on the personality. He becomes more timid, more inferior, uh, suffering from inferiority complex, more strained. He can't express. Even if he expresses, he expresses with the basis of this complexity of fears. And what he does is, with all the complications, makes things complex. Imagining even a simple thing, a complex one. And on the basis of the complexity, again he makes another complexity. So the whole personality becomes a jumble, a complex thing. Sometimes it, it takes an, uh, the, uh, the act of arrogance, or uh, what you say, an, a, an offensive mode also. Mm -hmm. Juvenile delinquency, for instance. You know what is the juvenile delinquency? Mm -hmm. The, the violent and uh, yeah. the so-called immoral behavior in the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the children, going and beating somebody with the violence and then shooting some, uh, some people, becoming uh, 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 part of the gangs, uh, this aggression and all these things. This is an aggressive expression of it. But what it, the basis of it is, actually even the psychological studies have proved that those who have mainly become juvenile delinquents, what they lose is their parental love and the parental security. Most of the people who, who do this are those that, even though that they have their parents and the parents love them, some, some link is missing that they don't trust that security is there. Then people become like that. That is the negative expression of the personality. So at the personality level, fears are there, but if with the sense of security is there, these fears can be expressed, they, they can be transformed into, the, into as a fully grown up, a, a developed personality. It is useful. Minus this, it becomes detrimental and harmful. It is like the harmful bacteria and the benevolent bacteria. Like the yeast, which makes Milk. At the grass level, it is true that the milk is broken, it is spoiled. But how it, how it breaks is, it breaks and it transforms into curd, which is the other stage of milk. <laughs> so, when coming in contact with, the, with, with, with you, and the fears, fears come up that causes suppression, a holding back, what to do? It won't. In, in fact, what happens in coming contact with me is, even though the fears are there, I don't discourage the fears. Yeah. But at the same time, you have an anchor. Right. Right. And after one or two experiences, that you don't even uh, simply think that it may be my only a psychological feeling. 
because it, it, you can practically experience it. Then you have the fears, you have the support. You fear and you do not fear. Then as the famous Baba's uh, catch word, why fear when I am here? change, fear of any, in fact, any unfolding, that that's fundamental. Yes, that is also there. And in fact, I have given you only one example of uh, how a child and the anchor that could be given delinquency. But even with, uh, with those that who have, with the parental love, still the basic fears are there. For instance, because she is the child, as long as she remains as a child, the parental protection will be there. So if she grows up and if she transforms, if she changes into an adult, the one that she, the, the parental affection, the security which she is getting, may, she, he may lose it. So there will be subconscious resistance even to grow. This is also another example. So the fears manifest in thousands and millions of ways depending upon the environment and the person. And this fear of not the, the fear of changing is also so basic because it is so common that a known evil is better than an unknown evil. Even though that our present position is an evil, it is not happy, but next step we do not know whether it will come or it will be even worse. So this, uh, this security, this sense of security again, which holds to the, the, to the past evil, to the old evil, even though that he, he doesn't know that the, what is going to come may be good also, but he doesn't want to take chances. So he's still true. If we go on, if you apply the principle which I have told you, all the fears will be answered. This is the formula, S square B square plus B square. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the sense of security or an anchor a belief system? You believe in something, you believe in Baba or you believe in Jesus Christ. If you truly believe in that, then you're, you're, you, that is your anchor and you can, and that's your love. If, if you it really work, works as an anchor, he is already transforming. The point is what he believes may not give him the sufficient anchor. Then comes the problem. That is what I already said. Yeah, when you believe it, you will get some experiences and then it, it stops being simple belief. It becomes an experience. Then it expresses totally. What happens with, with many people is they believe something which can give them the anchor, but it, it yeah. won't give the anchor. Yeah. But still they stick to it. There will be more yeah. even. Yeah. Not only the normal fears, the fear even to lose that belief. Lose that belief yeah. If it really, the, that so-called anchor is really giving him anchor, then there is no fear at all. That is the healthy development of the personality. Whatever I told Kevin, let us uh, forget it. Now in this context, <laughs> our world beliefs are, our concepts are the, are the branch on which that we are sitting and we are afraid that it may, it may be broken at any time, not able to bear the load of all your concepts and burdens. <laughs> but you do not have any other branch and you are, you are not able to go to other branch because you are afraid that you, that branch is even weaker. So when something happens to you that which gives you the push, the triggering, the initiation, <laughs> eh? 
which will give you another branch which seems to be you know do not know whether it is really stronger or not and when you hold to it and then if you really experience that it is stronger then you leave the old branch so i have to do the both the things i have to make you leave the old branch and i have to give you the a, a stronger new branch so the older concepts have to be have to be removed and a newer at the experience level and another branch has to be given an anchor has to be given it has to be done at both otherwise what happens if i don't do both then you will become more insecure because at least you are you are having one branch whether it is weaker uh, stronger even that is you shattered then you don't have anything to hold to that is why even though that i try to shatter many of your concepts you don't feel so much insecure also <laughs> because my main object is just not to shatter your concepts that is the basis of your now the your present being your present personality which is giving you frustration and happiness at whatever you call it and you are not able to uh, give it up so i have to both have to give you a stronger anchor a stronger branch and then give you a push to go from this old branch to the new branch and all my satsangs the mother motive is that <laughs> my main object is to to shift you to a stronger branch i am not interested whether the old branch is good or bad it all depends upon how how strongly you stick to your old branch If your sticking is stronger, then my shattering will be stronger. <laughs> what's what's the tortoise in the Dwarka Mai in the middle of the floor? What does it represent? That stone you see in the photo, the cross-legged photo. Baba is sitting on a stone like this. Yeah. You see this? Yeah. that stone used to be there on the spot where the tata is there ah. when they are trying to expand the hall right? and then they shifted the uh, the stone to the back just in order to make a mark to mark that the stone was here before that they have put the tata tata is tartais, no tata is in the in the, in the hindu mythology the tata is the is the one that which holds the whole earth the whole universe it is that the bottom of it the other the sacred symbols cannot be touched with the, with our food it is uh, it is defiling them so it is already underneath our the, the whole ground so there is nothing wrong even if by if we to step on it so there is the safest symbol the sacred safest sacred symbol which cannot be defiled by our touch of our food <laughs> that is why it is there. he didn't always sit on that stone <laughs> No, no, no. He never used to sit on the stone. He used to sit uh, at the place where the photo is now. The Dwarka Mai photo. You know? Only once he sat on it. Before the devotees used to wash clothes on the stone. <laughs> you see the Dwarka Mai main portrait there. That is his usual pose. That is how he used to sit the whole day. You, you have this photo, the smiling Baba photo. Now the photo is facing south. And what is the meaning of the the simple different meaning in facing south? Do you know? Because that is the only uh, convenient posture where he can sit in uh, Manda Masi. Where else he can sit? It, it so happened that the Duni is now situated in the Ajnaya. Uh, that corner in the, in the Hindu uh, Hindu conventional architecture, the fire has to be, even the kitchen and everything, the southeast corner. But what happens? One has to think of Dwarka Mai. In those days, that part where the duni is, there the roof was not there in the early days of Baba. Even the one part of the the roof was was already uh, the, it fell down. Only one part was there. 
and then that is a masjid. In the masjid, the sacred object is the nimbar, that niche. Yeah. That niche is, is towards Mecca. All the Muslims, all over the world, they turn towards the west, to the, to the, to the niche. That is the window through which that they can pray to the, to the Mecca. That is only that symbol. That is where all the, uh, they come and they do nawaj. And it is disrespectful to keep a respectable object to the left. Always a respectable thing should be always kept to the right. That is why even while dining also, Baba used to make uh, Bade Baba sit to his right only, always. Because he used to treat him as a, as a honored guest, always. So whenever that he used to dine, Bade Baba has to sit to his right only, not to the left. So just think, if at all that you go and you want to sit there, you have to get some breeze and some air, and where do you sit? You sit exactly where Baba used to sit on. There is no other go for you. And where the Duni has to be placed, the opposite. The opposite happened to be the South, the south East Karna. Then the Nimbar is to his right, then the Duni is to his front. Because this, there is no other uh, reason for that. As far as we know, he doesn't. A saint of that stage doesn't have a discrimination of directions because he feels all directions. He is facing all directions and uh, he is there everywhere. That, is, that was his experience. And what, why that became so important is, usually a saint or while you are sitting in meditation, people are not advised to sit facing south. It's considered to be very inauspicious in, uh, in Indian tradition. Because south is the, is the direction in which the realm of the god of death is situated. Yama. The Yama. <laughs> so it is facing, Yama means facing death. So they, they like to face the direction where the god of wealth, the realm of the god of wealth is situated <laughs> like that or where the realm of the god of power is situated, but they avoid south. People are not, well, not even to sleep north and, north, north and south direction, facing south. That is looking at Yama, looking at death. If you look at him and he may also look at you, and then there, <laughs> there is, there is the whole thing. <laughs> Even they don't put even photo also, a picture facing south. Many people objected when I did the, the cyber in my, in my house there. When Baba's picture is uh, turned towards south, and this uh, these people who were who had this traditional yeah. stuff in their brain, they came and they said, oh, facing, uh, putting Baba's photo facing south. It is the convenient place where that I can put Baba's photo. <laughs> that is why I put it, not because of any other reason. If I have an, can, another convenience, I will put it in some other direction. Here, in fact, this shed, constructing the shed, you can't see any mandir or any satsang hall like facing <laughs> north and south. Yes. Go anywhere in India. Yes. But this is the most, to me, it is the convenient posture where I can have the length and everything. So I said, it doesn't matter. Go. When people come, the Baba should come. Even from the gate, they could, they could be able to see Baba. No, they're going in the road, that's... See, from Pimple also you can see. I don't know, this stuff, this uh, superstitious stuff, don't bother about it. Come on, put it. In fact, it is the... In, uh, in Indian, it is the most radical <laughs> satsang hall. <laughs> very, very radical. <laughs> to you, it doesn't mean anything. Mm. Indian can't even think. Go and see any mandir in India. Any mandir. And I sleep north, north, uh, south, in my room. Facing south, sir. Facing south. <laughs>
ਕਿਸ ਦਰੀ ਤੋਂ ਉਹਨੇ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਕੁਝ ਦੇਰ ਦੇ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਤੂੰ ਬਾਬਾ ਇਸ ਇਨ ਆਲ ਡਾਇਰੈਕਸ਼ਨਸ ਐਂਡ ਵੇਅਰ ਐਵਰ ਯੂ ਫੇਸ ਯੂ ਫੇਸ ਬਾਬਾ ਥੇਸ ਨਥਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਫੀਅਰ బాబా సమాజ్ ఇచ్చినప్పుడు మరి కాళ్ళు ఊరి సోత్ పెట్టారు సార్ అది హిందూ సంప్రదాయ పక్కల మన సంప్రదాయ సార్ ఇది హి ఇస్ ఆస్కింగ్ బాబా వాస్ ఇన్ టూమ్ ది లైంగ్ టు ది సౌత్ నార్త్ ఇస్ ఇట్ ది హిందూ ట్రెడిషన్ ఆర్ ది ముస్లిం ట్రెడిషన్ హి వాస్ బరీడ్ అకార్డింగ్ టు ది ముస్లిం ట్రెడిషన్స్ ఓన్లీ అండ్ ఈవెన్ అకార్డింగ్ టు ది హిందూ ట్రెడిషన్స్ ఏ మాంక్ ఏ సన్యాసి హి హస్ టు బి బరీడ్ facing north his face should be north but preferably in the sitting posture but when if it is not possible to entomb him in the sitting posture for instance to some to some people the rigor mortis may be may come and then they can't make him sit then in that case he, his face should be towards the north in that case the both the traditions are they, they, they agree the face should be towards the north Yes. even though it the possibility was there that baba could be entombed in a sitting posture because even after 3 days baba's body didn't get rigor mortis at all actually he was made to sit in in dwarka mai for the, for two and a half days all the devotees came and took his darshan mm-hmm. but when he was lifted his limbs came as if that he was, he was sleeping so he could have been entombed like that but according to the muslim tradition he was put in a uh, in a box and then was what you call kafin mm-hmm. it is both the muslims and christian traditions the body has to be put in a kafin and then it will go baba was buried like that if it would be in into hmm? tradition he wouldn't have been burned and not buried no but it is monk has to be buried not uh, mm-hmm. yeah, not cremated only household he has to be cremated otherwise he has to be buried so the whole hindu tradition is based on the vedic ritual the vedic ritual is the ritual of fire it is the, it's the it's almost the whole vedic tradition is the fire cult the whole tradition the whole ritual goes around the fire so as a student when he learns the veda what he learns is how to do the fire ritual when he has all the lent the fire ritual then he has to be married when he marries first he starts the fire ritual himself his personal fire is installed in his house that because that was the deity in those days the image worship was not there in the vedic times the fire is to be the image of the deity the god and daily he used to worship the fire and and he is the one that who is properly initiated properly learned how to do the fire ritual they have all the rites and when he passes away people imagine that he become one with the the deity the object of the whole life long contemplation on the fire so the that fire which he lit and then he was contemplating the whole life with that fire his body also has to be cremated so the the assimilation will become complete the spirit has already been uh, assimilated absorbed into the spirit of fire now this material is also consumed by the fire so the fire goes to the fire with the monk the monk is not authorized to do he gives up he abandons all fire ritual any ritual 
and the monk is not authorized to do any fire rituals. All this Vedic rites, a monk should not do. Even Arthi? Arthi is different. It's not a Vedic thing. You read the, uh, my, my Arthi introduction. This will be answered. <laughs> How it has <laughs> transformed into the Arthi. The Vedic ritual was transformed. So, a monk, because he doesn't, he's already abandoned his connections with the fire, he should not be put to fire. So he is to be entombed. And a person who hasn't been married, he is also entombed, not only the monk. Who is not initiated into the fire ritual, a person who is not initiated in the <coughs> sacred thread, for instance, he has to be entombed, buried only, not cremated. The fire should not touch his body, because he is not right, he is not a proper man, where the fire can purify him. So if a householder is a yani, he's still burnt? He's still According to the tradition means he has to be burnt. He's still burnt because he's a householder, household, even if he's a yani. He has to be burnt. Yeah. Sometimes the, the sins will also be put just in the, in the Ganges, no? Not yes, married? that is also. The, that, that depends upon some the cultic traditions. differences are there, some tra traditions. Because you can't simply brand Hindu tradition as this. There are so many local variations in it. Some people, what they think is, by giving the body to Ganges, and it becomes food to the fish and um, these things. And so that you, that is punya, that is meritorious. Right. When I was asking you before about about saying, "Baba, I love you," and then seeing that it's the love that I love, it's the love that I was that I'm loving. Yes. The experience of love. The experience of love. Yeah. The yeah. concrete love. The concrete experience of love. Right. Before also you love, you love your love, but it was not expressive. Right. It was not, it cannot be experienced. It is not coming out. So in his presence, he triggers it. Right. And, and, and then, are you saying then when the need is great enough, then that will be continual? Or is it just by coming in contact with it again and again? Because, it comes, of, because once it triggers, it comes again and again. It comes again and again. But some, some very rare cases, what happens is that one time it triggers, and if it is not able to cater to all the needs of our basic being, yeah. then after some time it stops triggering. Achha. So that's why the other needs have to be seen in life? Because what happens is when, when you go at the surface level, you go with some <coughs> concepts. Yeah. Because already that you have superimposed on your mind certain concepts. And what happens is when you go there, immediately those concepts become fulfilled. You get a, a sense of fulfillment. Right. But what happens at a long time, then the real basic thing starts coming out. And then the person or the place, it stops triggering you because it doesn't cater to the basic things some kind of a mukti, a sudden peace of mind, a sudden stillness of mind, a blankness. A blankness can never be your need. But people, that concept they go and sit in front of a saint. And the moment <coughs> the mind becomes blank, oh, I attend samadhi. Oh, his presence is very powerful. And then what happens is, in the blank, actually what he was trying to experience, that blank, first he was actually craving for, it becomes hollow. Right, right. Then he starts experiencing that blank, that so-called blank he was all, all the way coveting for. It's become hollow. The more and the more that you feel become hollow, so it stops. <laughs> but I don't, uh, I don't experience love. It, I couldn't say it's love when I'm sitting in <coughs> Dwarkamai. It's more, it's not blank and it's not love. Because Baba never said about blankness. He always trying to cater to the basic human needs. They won't change. And so there is no possibility of Baba stopping or ceasing to trigger your love. He triggers from any, any aspect, any, any need, any concepts. He is there, able to trigger you. And what is that you are experiencing in Dwarka, my then? Is it fulfillment, sense of fulfillment? It's more than. That is your name that is given. That is why I, <coughs> love is his jargon, and I am using his jargon. 
and if i say fulfillment and i don't know anything more than fulfillment fulfillment is full there is nothing more than that hmm? it's an experience of fulfillment it's good that is your name of love or his his name of fulfillment he calls fulfillment love and you call love fulfillment and somebody calls something else the experience is the, is is different and that also differs by the what the by the what needs that you go and experience it it is relative he says peace i'm having peace at the contrast of some disturbance he says it is peace if you are needing something you are longing for something you say fulfillment right like that it does differs from which angle that you approach that 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 source of uh, triggering and it can it can change as well one day it intensifies like more and more that changes because after some time your needs may change some more basic needs may come to the surface the moment that the the, the surface needs have gone then what is waiting at the another level the panel it will come to the front again and then the experience changes and he caters to that also i thought there's only one basic need now you talk about the basic needs uh, basic needs what, what, what do you mean they will change from person to person then one has to decide or one has to experience it even if we don't know the need many people ask me even though they the because it, that has become a catch word to know your need even though that i i need not know the need if i know that my need is fulfilled that is enough that happens there so guruji what is all this the fulfillment and the changing needs have to do with when when ramana maharshi talks about the the formless unchanging reality he talks like that at least from what i've read he talks about something that's unchanging i told you about ramana maharshi that they, what did all the jargon that he used depending upon the people that uh, who was saying when you start using the jargon of love i have to answer in that yeah like okay. it when she talks about personality <coughs> psychoanalysis and personal <coughs> development i had to use that terminology juvenile delinquency <laughs> this and that growth personality unfoldment it's not that this not my jargon <laughs> are you saying this to me what, what we were just saying now what you were just saying now about ramana maharshi and using vedanta concepts are you saying that to me to cut my concepts and not to indulge my you concepts you can't cut it i can cut it mm-hmm. i've been doing it i know What's you that you can cut i know you, <laughs> I know you have <laughs> you if i ask you to cut you won't cut uh, <laughs> you will water it and then you will grow it <laughs> <laughs> you answered my question thank you <laughs> yes, <okay. laughs> i would water it <laughs> absolutely <laughs> thank you no no why why i tell you about ramana maharshi is people simply ask why when he said unchanging that that terminology yeah that is why i told you don't go by what he said how right. did he, his concept of arunachala did, did it change mm-hmm. or arunachala sees to give that sense of fulfillment to him after some time he lived life long there and till to the end even when he was passing away he was listening to the chanting of arunachala 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 and he he passed away yeah. and where is the connection between know yourself atma parmatma and arunachala and chanting of arunachala like our chanting of sai baba here if you you feel that it is uh, it's all bhakti marga here doing jap bhajan and all these things no read the life of uh, ramana maharshi he passed away amidst the chanting of arunachala and it was one of the things that he loved most there it, it the thought even doesn't come to your mind at all in what way all these things come to this is a gnana marga <laughs> gnana marga <laughs> what gnana marga it is <laughs> come and tell me you go around the hill what gnana marga it is huh? jyoti you go and look at jyoti and right in front of a ravana maharshi mandir that you lit the jyoti at the 6 o'clock and all the people looking at the, the at the top of the hill and looking at it what is the connection between who am i inquiry and that uh, that jyoti 
in the Talmud? <coughs> Why you don't think of all these things? Simply you have, you have all, you have come with the preconceived ideas. Because you have been told that Ramana Maharshi is Jnana Marga. He always advocated Jnana. He is an Advaitin. So even when you go there, and even when you see around what is actually going on there, it won't disturb you. But giving an arati to Sai Baba and people singing arati disturbs you. This is all traditional stuff. It's all bhakti. <laughs> you can go and touch the thing. There is no architects at all here. And because of inconvenience, now people are not going up and then garlanding Baba statue. Yeah, yeah. But in those days, about 10, 15 yeah. years ago, all the people used to go up, find the samadhi, and then used to garland personally. We used to do, give a bath also to Baba. There's no there's that uh, untouchables, this religion, that religion should not touch, and these this concepts are not there. No Brahmins and non-Brahmins concept here. Even, especially in, in Sayana, you don't see any even, even the slightest symbol of uh, a, a tradition. You don't see a, a picture of a deity any, anywhere around me. But still the concept comes, devotional path, Bhakti Marga, <laughs> doing bhajan here. Think. What I am saying is, be open. Yeah. Let not these things disturb you. When you go to Ramana Maharshi, you, you, you go to him in order to help, to, to receiving help from you for your inquiry. You, know, you, you won't think of it. But subconsciously what you want, you require is his help, his grace yeah. for the speedy inquiry, for the speedy realization of your inquiry. So your mind is on the grace of the Sadhguru. Now you come to Sai Baba. People are worshipping as they like as the, the, the symbols which at their disposal is available to them. Why do we bother about these things? If you come and say that it is my tradition that I have to salute him like this, oh, hello, Sai Baba. <laughs> how, how do you do? <laughs> Good, say that. <laughs> but that is also a tradition, that is what I am saying. If you don't want to say that if doing namaskar is a tradition and you should not do the ritual, then saying hello and then doing like this is also a tradition, a habit, a, a ritual. Why you have to say like this? <laughs> <laughs> and why have to shake your hands only? Come on, think. Because you are in the tradition, you have been born in the tradition, you won't question them. They become so natural to you. And here to the people, bowing down is so natural. That is the natural expression which is available to them. Don't be distracted by these outer forms. They have nothing to do with the thing which you are seeking from Sai Baba. You say, who am I? You know all I. Your I, everybody knows. But that is not what Bhagavan was mentioning, referring to. He was mentioning to the real I in his words. That means a superior thing which is beyond, which transcends this limited personality, which he calls the false ego. The Atman is which pervades everything, which is almost divine, the God, the perfect. The perfect is within you, but you are not able to experience it. Right. So try to inquire the I. It is experienced in you in the form of your own existence. And when you say, say, for instance, here people are saying Sai Baba and Sai Baba and Sai Baba. What is Sai Baba? Sai Baba is an another an equivalent of that I, that, that great I. Yeah. He said, I am living, I am moving in all the creatures. Whoever thinks that Sai Baba is only this five and a half feet body, they haven't seen Sai Baba at all. You think you and I are different, but in fact we are all one. This is all the things Baba said. So the real Baba is here. How he is, we do not know. So when you when we are chanting Sai Baba and Sai Baba, you are already making an inquiry. What is the nature of Sai Baba? Where is the Sai Baba? And calling the Sai Baba. Calling. Baba, 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 and calling. One that which is not visible, you are trying to make it visible. That is calling. You don't think that you are Sai Baba. So it is easy for you to know something which transcends you, your greater self. 
when we are already at the lower self, the experience of the lower self, it is very difficult to catch hold of another thing. So if, you, if, if people can cleverly, even though without their being conscious of it, what they do here is a kind of self-enquiry only. But I don't call it self-enquiry, I call it sci enquiry If at all you like a, a, a cooperation, a comparing notes between these two, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, let me put it like this. It's a nice way of <laughs> very nice way of putting When you put something in front of you, which is directly experiencing a greater <laughs> side of one, which is in fact yourself, but is more than that. And that more helps you to realize that self. Yes. He is not only that. To you at the concrete level, he is more than that. He is yourself and not only yourself. He is right. something outside also. And that helps you. Right, because he is something greater than yourself. That is what even Ramana Maharshi said. First you have to realize an outer guru and he will make you turn into the inside. How, how the turning will come? It's not actually outward and inward. A link between the two. Then it ceases to be outward or inward. And that here naturally, spontaneously, have, I haven't explained this to any, at any time to any of these people. Yeah. But what naturally happens is this. And that is why I don't consider that any, if at all, any, any sadhana, any practice or anything which is going on here is inferior to anything. What is being given is the, the best which is being given, even if you know it or you do not know it. I need not tell people that what you are doing is self-inquiry. They need not. What they experience is that, that is enough. 